Hi, this is Steve Belber, writer and director of What We Do Next. And I'm here today with Christina Compton, who um, whose lived experience has parallels, I think, with uh, some of the movies. We were excited to talk uh, with you, Christina, and thank you for doing this. Um, and maybe if you could just start with sort of talking about Volunteers of, of, of America uh, and the group and how your interactions with it came about and what your association with it is. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so Volunteers of America has been around for over 125 years. Um, we are a human services organization that operates across Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, Clark, and Floyd County, so across four states. Um, we have over 50 comprehensive programs, but some of our Larger ones, of course, are our substance and recovery support, housing support, and veteran services. Um, I entered, I became connected with Volunteers of America um, through their Freedom House program. Um, and that is a nationally recognized model um, to treat substance, substance use disorder and pregnant and parenting women. Um, they use evidence-based clinical services to combat not only substance use, but also like the underlining issues. Um, we use trauma-informed care. Um, it's, it's a real holistic approach. Um, so instead of just looking at the individual, in my case, right, the woman, um, I was looked at like the family unit as a whole. So I was not the only one receiving treatment my whole family was getting better together with me. Um, but, um, you know, Freedom House's goal is to end the cycle of addiction and end the cycle of trauma, um, which, you know, we know that increased trauma, especially at an early childhood age, um, increases the likelihood of substance misuse later on in life. So, um, you know, the the sooner that we can stop that cycle and end future trauma for the babies that these moms are taking care of, the better, you know, we're just trying to save the world one baby at a time. <laughs> um, but so I found myself um, incarcerated pregnant with my, with my youngest son. I have three kiddos um, and I was sentenced to serve, I was sentenced to serve a five-year sentence pregnant with Wyatt is his name. Thankfully, um, I had some interactions with uh, an alternative sentencing worker. She was a social worker. Um, we presented this, this idea at, for an alternative sentence that would release me from incarceration into a treatment center that would accommodate my pregnancy and then my parenting afterwards. Um, Freedom House was that, was that treatment center. So thankfully, I was released on shock probation out of prison, out of a state penitentiary into the Freedom House program. And actually, um, I arrived at Freedom House seven days before I gave birth to my child. So seven days from, you know, having a child incarcerated, which, you know, is that was a big deal for me. Um, so that was how how I originally became connected to Volunteers of America. Um, and then after after I graduated treatment, um, I remained in their aftercare service for probably two years or so. Within that time frame, um, I obtained a peer support certification. It's a state licensure that allows me to perform non-clinical therapeutic services. Um, so it's like that peer-to-peer -peer connection. So um, individuals know that they're that they're not alone. Um, so. Um, just so happened, Volunteers of America was having a job fair right after I took my certification. So I felt like, you know, this is, you know, take heed to ominous warnings I had always heard. So let's see, this is where, this is just what it's supposed to be. So I arrived um, at the job fair, not sure if I had passed my certification exam or not, um, started working, you know, completely, complete entry level as a therapist technician, recovery support technician, and then I've been with VOA for, um, I've been with VOA for over four years now, and I've been promoted a few times. So as it stands now, I'm the admissions manager for all of our addiction recovery services. So super, super proud about that. I'm also a social work student. 
So hopefully I'm in the middle of my last semester to wow. obtain my bachelor's. So June of this year, I should be um, a degreed woman, which is, <laughs> you know, a, a big, a big thing to, to someone like me. So that, that's an amazing, that's truly uh, what a, what a journey and, and what, and what a organization to, um, I'm curious, uh, you know, it, it, the parallels to this movie it, in New York City uh, is very different than Kentucky, obviously, but there do seem to be some overlaps. And I think that's something that we are really hoping our movie can, can, um, you know, uh, can speak to everybody, not just mm -hmm. uh, a woman, you know, uh, uh, Puerto Rican descent in New York or, or a mover. So tell me uh, if you, if you would, like, obviously the character uh, in the movie is dealing with uh, a lot of trauma um, and doesn't get the kind of help uh, that you eventually did get. Um, and uh, can you just talk a little bit about what, how you saw Elsa's character and where you, if at all, you identified with some of that? that oh, yeah. Of... Yeah. I, um, I identified with with Elsa a whole, whole lot. Um, so down to the, the trauma, the abuse, the, you know, wanting to being torn between not wanting to be separated from siblings to wanting to protect them, um, down to like longing and missing the abuser. I mean, there was, there's so much trauma and trauma and different types of trauma and all throughout different stages of life in, in my background. And again, you know, trauma is, we see, I see so much of that on, on the day to day professionally and personally. Um, I don't know how an individual couldn't identify with a traumatic experience happening in their life, even if it wasn't the same type, you know? Um, and then the, the incarceration, man, I remember, um, I remember being locked up in, and I went up for parole. Um, and I think I was, I was set to give birth in about eight weeks at that time. And I went up for parole and I was really banking like, okay, this is, this is the ticket out where I'm not going to have my child locked up. And I got flopped on my parole, I think 12 months. Which in, which to me was like a guarantee that I'm not going to keep this baby. And, um, you know, also in, in my background, I had some CPS interaction and lost custody of my older two children. And um, if I had lost my youngest, I would I would have took my life. Um, I was I was in a space where mentally, emotionally, spiritually, I couldn't lose another child. I knew that I was not going to I was not going to make it through that. Um, I didn't have the will or or the want to make it through that. The only hope that I had was, you know, this little this little baby that I was carrying and a whole lot of uncertainty on what was going to happen with him, what was going to happen with me. Um so that that desperation and that fear of going of going back there because just like you know just like parole on shock you walk a very a very very tight line and sometimes it doesn't matter if you're in the right or in the wrong you have to go sit down and explain that to a group of people whenever they have time to meet with you and that's not going to be before you have to report to your next day shift so wow. um you know and it's 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 a um, it's a real dark place to be, very are very there, dark place to be. That's unimaginable for most people. I think it, it, are, are were there any services in in prison that you could turn to prior to meeting up with, with Volunteers of America? Where was there any resources you had access to? So it has been, it has been several years since I have been I've been incarcerated, um, and, and I will say that I think our state is doing better now than they were then. But I will also say that I don't think that we're doing enough. Um, but so whenever whenever I was in prison, we had a substance abuse program at SAP MRT. We had. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings come in. There were various programs, but the thing with those programs is your security level has to be a certain part. You can't have any infractions. You have to go on a waiting list or you have to see the parole board and the parole board has to recommend it for you because this is, you know, you wanting to do this program and someone being 
someone being told they have to do this program to get out, mm -hmm. they're going to take precedent over someone that's really trying to help. And, and unfortunately, um, you know, the correction system is not set up for true rehabilitation. Um, so you get into this cycle of recidivism and, and it's hard, it's hard to get out of it. And it's hard to break those labels that are placed on you. It's real hard. I can imagine. Do you do you feel like you had any um, uh, ability or or time or or knowledge really? Because so few of us have any knowledge of how to cope with the underlying trauma that was causing the addiction. In your case, did you did you deal? Did you have any internal like ability to cope with it or or programming beyond just treating the cosmetic sort of addiction that was going on? Um. So prior, prior to coming into Volunteers of America, I had been in many, many treatment centers. And what I think was the difference at Volunteers of America versus the other treatment centers was that look at the trauma. Um, because it's, you know, if I can treat, I can treat my substance use disorder. In fact, the only thing I honestly have to do to treat my substance use disorder is to stop using. And then it goes into remission. But what doesn't change is, is your mental, the obsession, the compulsion, the, the fixation, the, the like, it's, it's so, it's so incredibly intense, like the feeling inside of you that says you have to do this thing that you know is going to destroy you and destroy your family, but you have to do this. Um, if you don't get down to like, what what causes that then you're going to you're going to be in this in this cycle this pendulum right of recovery and relapse and recovery and relapse but with with adding in the clinical services and and addressing me personally addressing my trauma i could have never have done that on my own because i was i was experiencing trauma and and like and being triggered by things that I wasn't even aware had impacted me. Um, so things that I thought that I had processed, that I had been through, that, you know, I had masked um, and legitimately like, things in my early, early childhood that that I really didn't even remember. And But getting, but like partnering with with a clinician and working through those things. And, you know, for, for a while I was seeing a psychiatrist also, and, and I just need, I needed a lot of help. I needed a lot of help. And, and fortunately volunteers of America was, was an agency that was able to provide all of that help again, not only to myself, but to my children as well. Incredible, incredible. It, and it's true. You used the word trigger. And obviously in the, in this movie, we see Elsa being triggered uh, and her addiction in a way is almost rage or anger or yeah. the inability to contain, you know, her, her emotions a little bit. Um, so it, can you talk a little bit about reentry? I mean, luckily you, it seems like you had Volunteers of America by the time you were exited from the system. Um, but can you talk about what is required of individual strength to deal with what must be a huge daunting process of coming back out knowing that temptation is is out there knowing that you still might be triggered by anything anyone because of the underlying problems i i know um incarcer incarceration is a, is a whole beast in itself like when we talk about the the trauma like that itself is is a, is a whole nother experience. Um, but, but I will say that it's an experience that never, ever leaves you. Um, it never leaves you. And for me, the fear of returning has, has never left me either. Now, thankfully, you know, I've put in some work and, and I've turned these like negative stressors into like positive stress. So like, you know, I'm not going back to prison today. Let me buckle my seatbelt. You know, it's like, um, but so thankfully, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to, to, you know, navigate my life in a way where that's not a potential for me, but even though it's not a realistic potential, it's still a, a very real fear. Um, and I, it's first, first coming out is so, it's so different, um, down to, you know, in, in our county jail, whenever I was frequenting, 
the the sinks didn't have like a a turn thing so you pressed a button so when your the water was off it just turned off on its own when I first came home I would walk out of the room and realize that the water was still running because I was so conditioned to hit the button you know and it's it's small things like that 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 you don't think about, or I would go to the grocery store and then come home and like put my food up. And I feel, and like my grocery list looks like I was shopping off of canteen, you know, um, because you just get so conditioned and routine that it's, it's hard to break that. And then, you know, it's not exactly an environment where you're, where it's safe for you to be vulnerable, or it's safe for you to be a free thinker, to bounce ideas off of one another, or to advocate for yourself, let alone someone else. Um, so you're, you know, you're taught not to be that way. But then whenever you enter into the world, you're supposed to know, oh, let me dress up and go to a job interview. Let me go get an ID. Let me talk to this landlord. Let me advocate to probation and parole to you know, do whatever, let me, that's not realistic Mm. because you've been conditioned not to want anything except for, you know, your meal and your shower for the day. Don't ask for anything else. Um, And so it's, it's an adjustment and there's not enough services and and it's the, the service is there, but the need is so high. There's so many incarcerated individuals I mean, I'm sure those re you, they've got to be swamped, swamped. Yeah. Uh, which you know, just like every other social worker, especially you know, I, I know for sure in Louisville, all of the social workers have way too much work on their on their plate. You know, there's just not enough. It, you see that everywhere. It's true. Yeah. Um, in, in our film, we see Elsa definitely. I think uh, very scared of going back, you're willing to do almost anything not to go back, and 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 that speaks to what you're talking to. And I, I wonder sometimes about the word agency for her character, and whether you know someone might watch this movie and think, oh, she should just get her act together and and stop, you know, blackmailing people or you're leveraging her power. And how did you feel watching that? Did you feel like Elsa get a get a grip, or were you, uh, or did you understand that? that she was desperate not to go back or and it, it sounds like a loaded question but it's really an answer as you wish um elsa did exactly in my opinion elsa did exactly what any individual would have done in her position with the tools that she had she utilized her resources um i honestly feel that elsa was harmed very very early by by a person that was supposed to be credentialed and and protected and then she was reharmed again once you know to for a politician to save face so i mean she was honestly doing what what she was taught by the by the professionals and the individuals that were supposed to be helping and supporting and and doing that and that wasn't from the outside looking in, they could say, yeah, you know, she was connected. She was connected with this agency and she was receiving these services and this tragic thing happened, right? This freak accident. No one could have predicted it. That's not factual. <laughs> that's that's not real. Um, and then, you know, as I don't know about New York, but here um, we have mandated reporting and that, you know, abuse of a child, especially sexual abuse, is it should have been reported. There, there was a lot of missed intervention for Elsa. Um, and what saddens me is that that is a lot of women's stories, um, especially women that are not Caucasian. Um, you know, the services and pathways to help are, are not handed out in an equitable way. And unfortunately, it's women like Elsa that fall by the wayside because they're seen as dispensable, you know? Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, I feel like she she played her resources, the ones that she felt she had in the best way that that she could, whether that was right or wrong on a moral standard. Um, mm-hmm. I absolutely, I can't say that I would have done anything different. That's interesting here, yeah. I know you didn't serve twice, and uh, uh, but can you imagine what uh, what going back might have been like for a character like that? It, what what it does to your hope, your um, 
and and to the tools that the, the tools that you do have if you're stripped of your freedom again um go, going back man um thankfully that has not been been my experience um but to th to think about that like that and especially to go from so you get out you get a job you start becoming you know successful you're able to to help your family you're reengaging in relationships you have friendships you're you know enjoying your life and then to find out that all of that can be taken away and you're completely powerless and you have no say so no defense um and then you know when when you're working when you're working with therapists and, and you're working on yourself you pick up these tools right these coping skills and and you start to to obtain this like emotional maturity and this and this self awareness and then and you you start to operate with individuals in a in a healthy way um instead of like you know that i just want to take 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 like where how I have to the survival thing so instead that's what so you go from you go from this survival mindset whenever you're incarcerated and, and then you have the opportunity to come out and do something different and, and thrive mm -hmm. and then to have that stripped away and have to go back to that that survival it's almost worse because now you know how good it can be because Elsa was incarcerated at a very, very young age. Um, she didn't probably didn't experience much adult life, maybe adult esque because of you know her her situation, but real deal adult privileges and freedoms and and you know income and and all of those things that come with that. You know, watching helping her brother and you know being able to do those things that that fulfill you emotionally and sp spiritually. Mm -hmm. And then to know that all of that's going to be ripped from you again. And then to have an out date also like, okay, I'm going to go. And this is the day that I'm going to leave and to keep obtaining more time and more time and more time. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's pretty, pretty bleak. Um, is that, are there parole preparation programs? I mean, it sounds like VOA does that a little bit, gets in there and helps you prepare for your parole hearing. Um, so that you really go in there with with every advantage that is, is available? Um, unfortunately, we do not have access to them prior to, we don't have access to incarcerated individuals prior to their parole board hearing. And I, I know I know that there's a process there to prepare for the parole board, but I'm not 100% certain what, what that process was. I didn't get, they sent me an email on like the little kiosk thing and, and let me know, yeah, you're going to hang out with us for a while longer. Um, but so I didn't get to meet with them face to face or, you know, they, there was no like, no rapport. They literally saw me on paper, my charges and made a decision based off of that. Um, so would that have been helpful, I assume, or had, had if there was more intervention available to these services like where you work now to get mm -hmm. in there early? Yeah. Um, Elsa, so the the parole, the parole process is, is different for different people. I don't know what makes the difference. I know that some individuals get like a, a parole board hearing. They get to actually sit down and like, you know, go and meet the parole board and like present themselves. Um, again, that wasn't my experience, but I know that that, that, that is, can be an experience. Um, but I would, I would imagine that Elsa probably went up for parole a couple of times and was told, okay, you need to do this, that, and the other, because typically when, when you're not granted parole, they give you a plan. Okay. So you didn't, you didn't get released now, but we would like you to take parenting classes, um, job training, go to substance abuse program. And once you complete all of these, these programs, then we can reevaluate at your next parole board hearing. Gotcha. But so if, if I would love for VOA to get into, I would, I would speak fear the way for VOA to get in to get into the prisons and and the jails and and help people get to the to the help that they really need because I don't think that 
I'm not saying that I don't think individuals should be held accountable, but there's more to that. Um, also, you're, I feel like they should also be held accountable to um, make sure that they're healthy and, and addressing, you know, mental health and other things to not only keep themselves safe, but our community also. Absolutely. That's part of it. You're right. Well, let's end with one last plug for VOA. It, can you just describe, is, it's a national program, I assume. Is it, is it in all major cities? Is it everywhere? And um, and if people wanted to, you know, even donate to it, like what is, what do you, what, give me, give me a best plug for what it does best and what it, and what it can do. So v, VOA is all over, all over the country. Um, we are VOA mid-state, so we operate, we operate out of the four states, which is Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, Clark, and Floyd counties in Indiana. Um, we are, of course, a nonprofit organization, and um, the donation process, I'm not 100% certain, but our website is voamid.com. Dot org, and you can see all of you know some amazing stories, maybe even my own, um, <laughs> and, and see some of the work that we're doing, not only you know in the local Louisville community, but all over the country. It's amazing. I, I encourage people to give. It sounds like it's done amazing that you're doing work for others now in an amazing way, and um, and this was very enlightening for me personally to to sort of um, understand how universal an issue this is. Uh, I was sort of you know, focused on on the the New York aspect of it, but to hear the overlaps with uh, your your experience is amazing. Uh, I cannot thank you enough, Christina. This is this is great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.